Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Pastor Rod here, and on behalf of the churches of Limesville and Flint Hill, we welcome you to this week's virtual message. Today is September 18, 2022, and we are in the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. You know, it's important how you punctuate your writing, making sure you have the commas in the right places. A woman who was concerned about her husband, who had joined the Navy, handed a prayer request to her pastor, which read, George Bowen, having gone to sea, his wife desires the prayers of the congregation for his safety. Well, the pastor read the note to the congregation, but he misplaced the comma, and this is how it came out. George Bowen, having gone to see his wife, desires the prayers of his congregation for his safety. <laughs> that probably should be a prayer for me each week. But anyway, as you can see, when you misplace the punctuation, if, when you put the comma in the wrong place, it can definitely change the dynamics and meaning of the message, as it did in this case. But praise God, the Bible tells us that God knows what we are going to pray even before we actually pray it even if we make the punctuation marks in the wrong place. We're going to read this morning about prayer from the uh, first letter to Timothy that Paul wrote, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And this is entitled, Prayer for All People. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. People, this is the word of God for the people, God, and thanks be to God for that word. Amen. This morning... I want to talk, talk about prayer. And, and the need that we have to pray for everyone. Perhaps even those who aren't quite so nice to us. For whom, we, for whom are we to pray? For everyone. Did you get that? Everyone. This isn't very discriminating, is it? Prayer isn't limited to good people, religious people, or deserving people. It doesn't favor those with a certain level of education or those with a certain intensity of need. Or ask simply to pray for everyone. Last week, if you recall, Paul was impressing upon Timothy how he, Paul, was the worst of all sinners. And yet, Paul was still forgiven and redeemed by Christ. And that we as Christians need to accept that redemption of others even if we feel like it's not warranted. Well, Paul goes on in chapter 2 to make the point that not only do we need to accept that redemption of our enemies, but we also must pray for them. Paul instructs Timothy in verse 1 that praying for all men is both a privilege and an obligation. It is a sheer privilege for us to have an audience with God on behalf of our fellow men. And it is an obligation too, for we are responsible to all with reference to the good news of salvation. I mean, after all, isn't that what we're called to do? As church members, we need to be prepared to pray. Our hearts must be right with God and with each other. We must really want to pray and not pray simply to please people as did the Pharisees or to fulfill a religious duty. When a local church ceases to depend on prayer, God ceases to bless his ministry. It seems to me that we live in a society that is growing more and more anti-Christian by the day. A society which declares right is wrong and wrong is being right. We like to think of America as being one nation under God. But I feel that is quickly eroding away to the point where men live as if God were dead or irrelevant. We can complain all we want about the situation we are that we're in here in America this is where we are and we've been placed here by the providence of the almighty God 
And as a result, we need to know how to live for God in a lost and broken world. Some men think they may have all these things figured out, but none of us really do. However, Paul in these verses does deal with one of the one area where we can all impact America and quite possibly the entire world. We have an area of Christian activity that has the power to change society and demonstrate Christ to a lost world. I'm talking about the area of prayer. Let us consider together the matter of Christ-like praying in a lost world. Verses 1 and 2 in today's reading identifies God's demand. And Paul first addresses the elevation of prayer. As I already mentioned, Paul starts out this chapter with the words, first of all. And this literally means first in order, rank, and importance. Paul tells us that our first priority in the church is that of prayer. This indicates that prayer is most important in the public worship of the church. And now sad to see how prayer has lost importance in many churches, is it? If I announced a potluck dinner after the service, people will come out of the woodwork to attend. After all, eating is the Methodist way, you know. But when we have a prayer walk or go to the schools to pray, only a very small number of people will show up. We need to ensure that prayer is not minimized and that there is not a decline in the importance of prayer. It seems that we have time for every pursuit and activity except that which is deemed most important. Prayer is often the stepchild of the church. Now we know, we all know and realize the power of prayer. We've seen prayer work in mighty ways right here in our own church, within our congregants. We still need to be reminded of the promises of God with regard to prayer. You see, God promises to hear our prayers, as we read in 1 Peter 3.12. Peter said, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. And then God has promised to answer our prayers. John 16, 23, very truly I tell you, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And prayer is the privilege and power of every saint. No one stands higher than you in the area of prayer. Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us then approach God's throne, his throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. My brothers and sisters of Christ, prayer needs to be exalted in our church more than ever. And it needs to be to overflow into our homes and communities. And to help us with that, Paul lists four elements that ought to be included in our praying each time. And they are, number one, supplications. And that's making requests, sharing our felt needs with God. Simply sharing our felt needs with God. The second, prayers. This word refers to the act of worship that should accompany prayer. We pray. When we pray, we are literally in the presence of God. Therefore, we are to pray in reverence. Third is intercessions. And this word means to fall in with. It refers to Christians taking the needs of others before the Lord. We pray for others. Our praying should not be selfish and self-centered. And finally, giving of thanks. When we draw near to God in prayer, our heart should be filled with gratitude for all he is, all he has done, all he is doing, and all he will do. Thanksgiving should not be tacked on to the end of our praying, but it should be a major ingredient in every prayer we pray every single time. I want to impress on you once again. We are to pray for all men. This tells us that there is no one on the face of this earth that should not be prayed for. And that there is no man beyond the influence of godly praying. Now Paul specified kings and those in authority in his uh, writing this morning. Well, is this because such persons are more deserving than the rest of us? Does the Bible favor people who have power? In truth, quite the opposite. The Bible shows any favoritism at all, isn't it? And those who are without power, like the poor, the orphan, the widow, the alien, the outcast, But we should pray for kings and other peoples in in high positions, persons in public office, and perhaps also those people who, because of their money, their social status, or or their prestige, are able to influence what goes on in government. Why? Well, we don't have to agree with them, but we should pray for them because kings and presidents, prime ministers, governors, mayors, and congressional leaders have the power to provide us with a quiet and peaceful world. Well, we can live, as the Apostle Paul says, 
in all godliness and dignity. We need to pray for them to seek and to understand the will of God. I once served as a chaplain in the motorcycle ministry, and we always had a day of prayer set aside for the first Sunday in March, and it was a national day of prayer. We had a list of different things we felt we needed to pray for, and I asked the lady if she would take a turn and pray for our president. Well, she was quite taken aback and very indignant and said, I will no way pray for that president. Well, first of all, as a Christian, why would you deny praying for anyone? And secondly, if, if you felt that negatively about someone, why would you not pray for them all even more so? This is pretty much what we are talking about here this morning, I think. You see, when we pray, we should, when we pray as we should, the product will lead us into a quietness externally and a peacefulness internally. This should produce in us lives of godliness and purity. When we pray, it pleases the Lord, and it is a good thing in his sight. You see, God is honored when his people pray as they should. It reveals faith on our part, and it affords God an opportunity to demonstrate his power. His power was demonstrated in the story of Daniel in the lion's den when he was spared of the lions as a result of prayer. And the same thing, the same result from prayer when Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were put into the fiery furnace. Because of prayer, these men were delivered and all the glory went to God. The bottom line is we should not just pray for ourselves. We need to pray for everyone. It is God's ultimate desire to see all men saved. Second Peter 3.9 says that the Lord is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We too are to be patient and compassionate. The world is more likely to respond to Christians who love them and pray for them than they are Christians who attack them and beat them over the heads with the Bible. Now, this doesn't mean that we are to condone their sin, but we are to love them and pray for them and share Christ with them. Church, brothers and sisters in Christ, these are perilous times for the church of Jesus Christ. Many in our society would love to see all Christians removed from the world. However, while we are still here, we are called upon to love, we are called upon to love the sinner and pray for our society. Of all the weapons we have at our disposal, prayer is the most effective in changing the world around us. And my challenge to you is that you become an effective prayer warrior for the Lord Jesus Christ. James 5.16 reminds us that we are to pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is a powerful and it's effective. I want to finish up with the story and final thought. There was a boy who was just 10 or 11 years old who became a Christian, a very young Christian, and who because of that be, began to pray for everyone else to become Christians too. He started with his own family, obviously. That's always a good place to begin with because their family is our primary responsibility. And then childlike enthusiasm took over, and he prayed for everyone, everyone, just as Paul told us to this morning. He prayed for everyone to come to the knowledge of God. It was a childish prayer, perhaps immature as he phrased it, but it was altogether biblical. And as wise as the Apostle Paul said, why pray for everyone? Because God loves everyone and wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. When we pray for all persons, regardless of how we feel about them or what they may have done, we are not only helping them, but we're also helping to make a better way of life, a better world for ourselves and for everyone else. It's really quite simple, isn't it? So simple that a 10 or 11 year old child may get it better than a sophisticated adult does. That's something to think about. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift and privilege of prayer. It is amazing to realize that by faith in Christ's sacrificial work on the cross, we have been given access to the very throne room of the Almighty God to intercede on behalf of others and to offer our prayers and supplications to you. Teach us to pray and help us to develop an ongoing attitude of prayer for thanksgiving and reverential praise. For you alone are worthy. And in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.
And may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you in all the days ahead. Amen. God bless and have a blessed week.